mountainous areas away from people. We don't see a ton of them at Granville Market or Dallas Road in Victoria or at Pike Place Market in Seattle. Oh, he wants to make sure you guys have a nice close look at them. Uh, we don't really see them around people. Uh, so what people were often seeing uh, out in the wild and what people were seeing here a few years ago was a juvenile bald eagle. Uh, so Hercules, uh, he was a little bit of an early bloomer. He had his full white head and tail by the time he was about three and a half years old. Uh, but some eagles, most eagles, sorry, they uh, have their full white head and tail by the time they're about five years old. Uh, some of them are later bloomers. They take six, seven, even eight years to get there. Um, and when they have that full white head and tail, it tells other eagles in the area that you're fully mature, that you're able to keep yourself alive, that you must be somebody that's worthy of getting together with and uh, having some babies with. So as a result, Hercules here, he's about 10 years old now. He's fully mature, and he's definitely on all those eagle dating apps making some matches for himself. Uh, we have lots of bald eagles here in our province. We have about a quarter of the world's population. Does anybody know why? It has something to do with what they like to eat. Salmon. Salmon, that's right. That's not only, uh, they are not only fishing eagles,
we do see a lot of these guys around. Uh, these guys are kind of colloquially known as the highway hawk. Uh, because we often see them along the roadside, sitting up on fence posts uh, and working uh, from those fence posts uh, and the telephone lines to catch things uh, that might be out down below. Uh, we, a lot of people throw things like apple cores and banana peels out of their windows and that attract mice to the roadside. Uh, having really good vision, these guys see it no problem uh, and they catch those things. Uh, it sounds really great, but unfortunately it does leave a lot of them getting hit by cars. Uh, so we do encourage people, even for biodegradable things, please keep those in your cars. Dispose of them later uh, because it puts those hawks less at risk. Uh, but a lot of people know them really quickly. They have that big bright red, uh, bright red tail on their backside. Um, but in their first few years of life, uh, we cut out there. No. Nope. Oh, okay. Uh, in their first few years of life, they don't have that red tail. Uh, much like an eagle, they have a juvenile plumage as well. So it's more of a, a bird tail on their backside. Uh, Magnum here is a really good example of a bird that we work with a lot uh, at different sites, uh, like the landfill. Uh, these guys are really good flyers. They can soar effortlessly up in the sky. Because being a beautiful hawk, as we call them, or uh, more of a broad-winged hawk, they're able to soar quite around quite effortlessly. Their wings are big and broad, they can catch rising hot air, and they can kind of ride air elevators through the day. So they go up, and a hot air thermal, up and up and up, rising up. They turn their nose in the direction they want to go next, and they just kind of settle down to the next one, and then they find another one, they go up and up and up, and they just ride all day long where they want to go. Uh, and that's really scary to the gulls. If they're up above the gulls at the landfill, they don't want to be underneath of that, so they do a really effective job of scaring those guys away. Magnum here, he's done an excellent job. We're going to see if he wants to make his way off. Let's give him a big round of applause. I find that these guys are a little bit under the species here in... Oh, we seem to go see if somebody's over there first. Uh, they're kind of an underappreciated species here in North America, just because we do see so much of them. Uh, fun fact about these guys, too. Do you want to come all the way back over, buddy? He's like, no, I would rather get treats out here. <laughs> do I do a long flight all the way to the front? Magnum, hey, come on. All the way over here. <laughs> we work on bird time here. We don't work as robots, uh, so we work on their time. Hi, good boy. All the way over. Um, Fun fact about the, these guys, though, uh, if you ever are watching, it's weird hearing my voice get louder. <laughs> um, if you're ever watching an old Western movie and you hear uh, an eagle, in quotation marks, uh, the sound of an eagle, nine times out of ten, it's actually a red-tailed hawk call that they've dubbed over that. Because eagles, uh, I think they make a very impressive noise, but it's sort of a, a ch chittering noise. Uh, whereas these guys make that loud scream. There you go. Oh, watch your tail, buddy. There we go. Uh, they make that loud scream. That's very impressive to a lot of other uh, animals and about. So uh, that's usually what you're hearing. Uh, we're going to take a quick uh, break from the raptors out here for a minute and see if the lovely gremlin wants to come all the way up to the front. He might walk himself on. Yesterday he kind of hopped and jumped. Oh, you missed your food, buddy. He's still working on his landings. Hi. Uh, does anybody know right off the bat what kind of, uh, at least what group of birds this one is under? A vulture, that's right. Uh, so vultures are not raptors, uh, and questionably even really a bird of, bird of prey. Uh, they will certainly uh, eat meat, but do vultures eat kill and kill? And, uh, it's really hard to talk when it's reverberating there. Uh, yeah, that might be better. Uh, do these guys catch and kill any of their own food? No. What do vultures like to eat? Roadkill. Roadkill, that's right. These guys are big scavengers. Uh, so they are carnivorous birds, but questionably, even really a bird of prey. Uh, but we love to talk, talk about vultures so much, even if they're not raptors, because they do so much for our environment. Uh, does anybody, uh, when they're out and about, uh, vultures like to eat a lot of dead stuff? Uh, do we want to live in a world full of dead, bloaty, rotten carcasses? No, nobody wants to live in a world like that. Uh, so vultures are nature's cleanup crew. They work uh, seven days a week overtime for us, making sure that we have a nice, uh, safe environment to live in. Uh, and 
they work even weekends like Canada Day weekend. Not everybody was up here enjoying a nice bird demo. These guys were working overtime for you guys, no stat pay at all, making sure that everybody had a nice same world, world to live in. Uh, and with those things, when they're eating them, uh, inside of rotting dead meat, uh, there is a lot of stuff that could really hurt you or I. Uh, even things like anthrax, botulism, salmonella, E. coli, uh, West Nile virus, uh, a lot of really gross germs that could even kill us. Uh, but these guys, they can eat those things, digest them in their stomach. They have a battery, or sorry, a pH of about one in their stomach acid. Uh, it's on par with battery acid. And that allows them to digest those things uh, and not pass them on in their poop. So it's really important that they take those out of our environment. On top of being so great for our environment as well, uh, these guys, <laughs> he's still a bird in training as well. He's pretty young, so we're just kind of working on getting him into the audience a little bit. He's doing pretty good. Uh, do I come all the way back over, buddy? Uh, on top of being so great for our environment, I just love vultures because they are very beautiful. I think they're some of the most beautiful birds in the world. They have that nice bald head against that dark background. A lot of birds, like king vultures even, they almost look like they have uh, mural on their head, or they have, like almost look like a wood carving. They're very striking birds. Uh, they have those big broad wings, allow them to soar and glide effortlessly. Uh, I think they're absolutely beautiful. Hopefully you do too today when you leave as well. Uh, but maybe that's just in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and on top of being so beautiful, uh, vultures are very smart social birds. A lot of the birds we're working with here, uh, they're very instinctual, they're very built for what they need to do, and they're smart, but they're smart in a little bit of a different way. Uh, they, they just are kind of built for what they need to do. Uh, whereas vultures are super intelligent, they have big brains in there, uh, they can solve puzzles, they can have friends, they can have enemies, uh, they can really make a lot of connections that a lot of other birds can't. So they're uh, right up there with even things like crows and book parrots and things like that. Uh, but they can't talk like a parrot or a crow because they don't have a voice box. But uh, definitely really awesome birds. Hi, buddy. Uh, we're going to see if a, go a gremlin here makes his way off the flying ground. I keep calling him Goblin because I work a lot with his brother at the center named Goblin. Uh, but we're going to see if he wants to make his way off after he picks those treats off the ground. All the way back, buddy. Not over to me. He's very comfortable on the ground on his feet as well because you need to be comfortable there to scavenge dead things off the ground. All right. Well, as he makes his way off the flying ground, we are going to take a little bit of a turn back to raptors here. Uh, you might notice there is a little bit of a break between us flying birds, and that's because the birds that we're flying out here are relatively territorial. As far as they're concerned, this is their flying ground. They don't want to share, and nobody else flies here. Uh, and we don't want you to have any National Geographic moments out here today. We want to keep it family friendly, uh, so we do just fly one bird at a time. Uh, but I do believe that he is safely away, so when Jess reappears, uh, does anybody know We see you regularly, woo, right by me. Uh, and they have those horns up on the top of their head. Uh, so very recognizable birds. We can find these from coast to coast, all the way up into the Arctic, all the way down in Central and South America, uh, in pretty much any habitat that you can think of, both rural and urban, as long as there's some sort of tree-like structure presence, uh, even in the desert. <laughs> it's getting blown around in the wind a little bit. Uh, as long as there's some sort of tree-like structure present. Uh, even in the desert, big cactuses, big saguaro cactuses, they'll definitely nest there. Uh, they are all over the place. Uh, they're able to catch and kill a wide variety of prey. Uh, even at her size, she could take down something as large as a porcupine, uh, which would be a pretty impressive feat. Uh, but they don't really care about those quills. You can almost say that she doesn't give a hoot. Um, but Danny here, she's not just any owl, she is a super owl. And in fact, all owls are super owls, because all owls have three superpowers. Owl superpowers, in fact. Uh, so her first owl superpower 
staring right at you there. It's actually looking more at the sky right now. Uh, there are those large owl eyes that give her super owl eyesight. Uh, see, these guys, they have very large eyes. They take up about two thirds to three quarters of their skull. And if we had owl sized eyes, our eyes would be the size of grapefruits or softballs. Uh, they are so large, they're fixed in place with a special bone, uh, so she can't even roll her eyes at all her jokes out here today. <laughs> um, and in the back of her eyes, she has a lot of rod cells, which are the light sensing cells that allow her to see really well at night. So she can see just as well as we can right now, but in almost total darkness. Uh, do you want to come right to the front, bud? Maybe? Maybe. She has selective hearing as well. <laughs> um, but these guys, they can see in almost total darkness, no problem at all. Uh, so they can see all of our faces out here in the dark. Uh, and that's mostly for getting around. But what they really rely on to hunt is their second owl superpower, which is their super uh, amazing uh, sense of hearing. Uh, so you and I, we have ears on the side of our head that lie equal with each other. And that allows us to tell if a sound is coming from the left or the right. But we can't tell if something's coming from up or down very easily. There we go. Like I said, we work on bird time. Uh, but these guys, they can, uh, they have an ear that faces up. It's a little bit further up than the other one, a little bit further forward, and they're offset from each other. And that allows her to hear really well left or right, but also up or down. Hi, it's right in front of you there. She does have a little bit of a blind spot in front of her face, too. Uh, but that allows her to hear really well left or right, up or down. She can make almost a image of sound and because of that she can catch things without ever seeing them at all even mice under a foot of snow she can catch those no problem uh, hi, you want to over here? Uh, they can hear a beetle walking on the forest floor from about 30 feet up they can even hear our thoughts no I'm totally joking with you but if she could hear our thoughts she would tell them all to me because we are the best of friends uh, so they really have that good sense of hearing so that they can hunt and run well, no problem. And then their third owl superpower uh, is that silent flight that they have. So Danny, as she was flying over your heads today, you might have noticed uh, you wouldn't really hear her at all. And that's because owls have really specialized feathers that are made to break up wind as much as possible. Uh, if you look at them under a microscope, they almost look like cotton candy. They're very soft and bendy and flexible. Uh, and because of that, they can fly absolutely silently. Part of that is they want to be able to sneak up on, on their prey. That's certainly an aspect of it. But the real reason is because they don't want the whooshing of their wings uh, to impede their own hearing. Because if they were flying around trying to hear things and all they had in their ears was uh, it wouldn't work very well for them. So they really rely on being able to hear uh, in order to fly. But Danny here, she's done an excellent excellent job today. We're going to see if she wants to make her way all the way back to the box. All the way. You might notice the birds are a little bit slower about going back to the box because they know they get lots of good treats out here. Uh, a lot of people ask us if the birds do live in these boxes and that's not the case at all. Uh, they are just for transitionary periods during the demo to make sure that we have a smooth demo that we're not constantly running off the field. Uh, but they just sit in there for a little bit. Uh, We've met an eagle, we've met a vulture, a hawk, an owl. Can anybody tell me what the fastest animal on the planet is? Just shout it out. A cheetah. Which box do you guys think the cheetah is in? No, we haven't had a cheetah since the incident. The insurance company didn't like that very much. Uh, but I did hear a lot of other guesses in the audience. Uh, so cheetahs are the fastest a uh, land animal. They can run super fast on the ground. They can go about 100 kilometers per hour on land, which is as fast as any of us would ever drive on the highway. Uh, but the fastest animal to uh, live on the planet is, of course, the peregrine falcon. Uh, we are going to be meeting a uh, half peregrine, half deer falcon out here today in, in falconry. It's quite common to see uh, hybrids of sorts. Uh, and when he comes up here, uh, he's probably going to be going pretty fast, probably not almost 400 kilometers per hour. Here he comes down the hill, and we're going to be playing a little game of cat and mouse. So this is Solo, and I'm going to be bringing this padded lure up right in front of his feet, pulling it away at the last second. And what I'm trying to do is to keep him engaged, to build fitness, to build persistence, 
emulate how he would hunt a bird in the wild. Uh, out in the wild, these guys take multiple stabs at their prey. Nine times out of ten, they are unsuccessful. And so he's ranging out, he's gaining lots of height, rocketing back towards me, and trying to psych me out. Sometimes he'll even face me right towards the sun to try and blind me in an attempt. But he's really hot on the lure today, so I'm going to say solo, hey! That's his dinner bell. He's going to come in nice and hot on that lure. Whoa! <laughs> you can take it right with him. And the crowd goes wild. Sorry about that. Very close encounter out here today. That was a really good flight from him. He was really trying there. Sometimes when he's not feeling as into it, he's more likely to go uh, land on one of these posts and maybe wait for a second while we're uh, just kind of not paying attention. He's also got me out of breath now. Uh, but Solo here, he's gonna take a second, uh, kind of regain his composure and gain some breath. And he's gonna eat his treat that's on the lure. He's not doing it very much right now. A lot of the times though, when they're on the lure, they'll take their wings spread them out like that, it's a behavior called mantling. And what mantling is, is essentially keeping that prey that they've caught away from any eagles, any other falcons that might want to come in and steal it from them, because he's worked really hard for that, he's spent a lot of energy, uh, and he doesn't want to give that up for just anybody. Uh, so he's going to hold on to that, it's kind of like if you're at the dinner table, you get a big piece of chocolate cake in front of you, you don't want somebody to come in and steal it away from you, so you go like that over your chocolate cake. Very, very similar. Now Solo today, when he caught that lure, he came in nice and hot. He hit it out of the uh, sky using his feet, uh, but sometimes he'll also hit it out of the air using a very strong reinforced chest bone called his keel bone. Uh, so he'll either try to kill it on impact, or if he's not able to kill it on impact, he'll kind of stun it, it'll hit the ground, and then he'll come down and he'll just catch his prey really quickly. Good job, baby. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we talk to all the people too. Uh, he'll try to stun his prey and just patch it on the ground. On his beak, he has a really uh, small notch called his tomial tooth, and that essentially allows him to snap his prey neck really quickly. Uh, sounds pretty gruesome, but he doesn't want to wrestle on the ground with his prey forever. If he was to do that, he was to break a toe, break a talon, break part of his wing, break a feather, that could cost him his life. He really relies on being able to hunt and fly efficiently in order to survive. And as a result, he needs to make sure that prey is done really quickly. Uh, but Solo here, he was the final bird of our demonstration today. Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed watching our birds fly, you've learned a little something, and that you want to go back out into the wild, and uh, or into your own home, home environments, I should say, and uh, help to conserve birds out there. Uh, I am going to be hanging out here at the front with Solo, so if you'd like to come down, have a look at him, take any pictures that you might want to take, uh, and just ask any questions you might have. Totally cool. Um, we do have two more demonstrations today, uh, later in the day, so definitely come check us out again if you're interested. Uh, if you'd like to follow along with our birds' adventures, we are on social media at Island Raptors. I believe we're even on TikTok these days. We're really keeping with the times. Uh, but without further ado, thanks for being such a great audience out here.